This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everyone to our talk tonight, East Windsor's African American West Airport Community. I'm Kim Luke, reference librarian at the Heightstown branch. First, I just wanted to highlight a few things going on in the library system before we get started. And first, next Thursday, March 2nd, we'll have an introduction to New Jersey genealogy, a class with Regina Fitzpatrick from the New Jersey State Library. Regina formerly worked for the New Jersey State Archives with the New Jersey Genealogical Collections and teaches genealogy classes for the New Jersey State Library. This virtual class will be on March 2nd at 7 p.m. And the other thing I wanted to highlight is our annual, actually our 14th Trash Dart Contest is happening now. Remake, reuse, and renew the items you would recycle or throw away into something unique and beautiful. The Lawrence Branch is accepting submissions beginning next Wednesday, March 1st, and details are on our website under the Events tab. But now, let me introduce our speaker for tonight. This is Charles Stoltz. Cappy was born, he goes by Cappy, and was born and raised in Heightstown, graduated Heightstown High School and Roanoke College, Salem, Virginia. Many branches of his family settled in central New Jersey in the mid 1700s, and after many generations of family farming and ministry, his great grandfather started a funeral home and insurance business in 1881. He's operated the insurance agency as a fourth generation business owner since 1973. So he has a, a deep roots in this community of Heightstown and East Windsor. He has received many awards in New Jersey and nationally for his contributions to the insurance industry, as well as local recognitions for his community service. Always a student of history, he has been active in many aspects of the Heightstown East Windsor Historical Society, which was founded in 1971. The society has a beautiful museum, the Eli House, and they saved the old railroad freight station, which serves as a meeting room and archives. He currently serves as its president and its editor of the newsletter. He has presented many historical programs in his towns and leads downtown walking tours a, new, a number of times a year. Other than his college years, he has always lived in Heightstown. He's married to Christine Conley Stoltz from Cranberry, and they recently celebrated their 51st anniversary. They have three adult children and six grandchildren, four of which also live in Heightstown. And he wants you to know that you can find the Heightstown East Windsor Historical Society on their website, www.hewhs.com and Facebook. And they are hoping to resume their popular biannual house tour in 2024. Recent virtual tours, tours are available on the website and YouTube. And the society is currently raising funds to add on to their ICAR archive library. And Cappy, if you're all set, we can go ahead and get started. I'm okay, going to pull up your, your slides and go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and thank you all for uh, for joining. Uh, I saw a lot of the names popping up, and so I know some of you that were here uh, when I uh, did the one at the Trent House. You may notice my, may not recognize my voice, and that's because I was just with my sixth grandchild up in Vermont over the weekend. And of course, uh, he brought me a gift back from school. So I've uh, been fighting some laryngitis and a little cold. So excuse me, if I have to take some sips of water and blow my nose, but I think uh, we'll make it through it. Um, I've, I've modified it a little bit from the talk that I gave at the uh, Trent House. I think it was last year, I forget exactly the, uh, the month. Uh, just again, because many of you have heard it, you'll hear mo much, much of the same, but I've added some, uh, some other items. Um, I wanna start by mentioning that I have uh, taken a liberty of taking some of the information. Um, many of you have seen this book, but a lot haven't. It was written by John Orr and published in 1998, and it's called Reflections from the Shrine. Um, those who are in school with me, uh, Nate, Marie, uh, will know that John is uh, uh, Beth and Lynn's father. And uh, he did a great job in the book 
And uh, one of the chapters is he entitled Our Colorful Past. Uh, it was a, a chapter quite, quite lengthy as regards to the black families that he grew up with, which would have been back in the 1920s and 30s uh, before Mr. Sumbry uh, came here. Uh, but it, uh, I'm going to quote from that chapter because I think it's uh, pertinent. Uh, there, quote, there was the quiet strength of Sam Turner with his abiding interest in youth and boy scouting. Then there was Vernon Sugar Reeves with whom I would fight sometimes during recesses in Bryanville. And later we would pick potatoes together during the summer harvest. Migrant workers were being chucked in here from the South to harvest. Their housing was all too often substandard and poor sanitation was the norm. There were exceptions, but they were the minority. On payday, saloons and lonely weekends made for a volatile mixture. These remembrances do not do justice to the many other black people not named but who had a decidedly positive influence on our community. Heightstown's tapestry has always been enriched by the Black American's presence from our earliest days. Although he wasn't raised here, uh, one such man of, uh, of equal prominence when I was growing up was uh, George Sumbry and his wife, uh, Evelyn. Uh, he was a uh, admired man, and um, I, for one, never heard anybody say anything bad about him. What got me on this was a article that was written by Curtis Crowell in the our newsletter. So on that website that was mentioned, you can go to it and see the spring 2019 issue which was all about Mr. Sumbry. Curtis uh, befriended him in some ways because he would see him when he was cutting the grass of a neighbor. Uh, Mr. Sumbry, I would see that as well, as well as uh, stopping in the store and also seeing him around town as well as uh, Mrs. Sumbry. And um, he he had quite a, quite a history growing up and, and Quite a uh, quite a nice family that um, certainly we all who went to school together remember quite well. Curtis also mentioned that it was it was great to get to know Mr. Sumbring and write this article doing the interview because Curtis was from Long Island, so he didn't know much about the history of Heightstown, let alone the Black history of Heightstown. Okay, Kim. So again, this all started when I read this article that C C Curtis had written, and um, I always saw Mr. Sumbry working somewhere in the in his spa sport, spare time. He also worked, uh, I think, pretty much full time at Bronze Nursery, which was behind the old high school, or the younger folks will know it as the Grace Rogers Norton School. Um, and their son Nathaniel, I always call Nate was uh was in my class uh nate has become uh, quite skilled in uh in horticultural art as was um his father and i'm sure that's uh why nate took it up and does so well with it okay kim <clears throat> mr sumbry had uh, left his home in alabama in 1929 at the age of 13. Uh, he was with his older brother as they were searching for work. Uh, he was ninth in a family of 11 children and the grandson of slaves. And by the way, I'm not gonna read this whole presentation, but this is important, so I wanna get it right. Uh, he and his brother were part of the great migration from the South to the North in search of work. Again, he left his family at age 13 with his brother uh, searching for work. There's much more to the story, uh, but he found the Heightstown East Windsor area when he, he was a laborer up here, very appealing. And um, it drew him back here as we go on in time 
כן. After returning from our World War II, he bought a house in a land on Airport Road, which many of you are familiar with, and he raised his four children there. Uh, when you, if you get a chance to look at the article, either Nate was always uh, shy or suffered from the same thing as me as the fourth child, and that I'm not in any family pictures. Uh, so you won't see a picture of Nate, and he was shy. He wouldn't send me one to put in, this, uh, in that issue. Uh, but it's a uh, it, it, it's very interesting article to read in, in its entirety. Um, then out of nowhere, uh, this article obviously you can Google different articles, and I received this call from Aula. Now Aula, I knew is George growing up, but I didn't know him that well. I'd only met him a couple of times, and of course I knew his uh, Marie Margaret and Nate's brother, and. Um, he asked me out to lunch. So we uh, went out to lunch and um, had, a, had a discussion on what he had on his mind. Uh, Kim? This is, this is George, um, Mr. Sunbrief, of course, would be, be the only thing that I ever called him. And he was always seen in his straw hat, Kim. As I mentioned, he loved his gardening. I, had a, I remember his greenhouse in the in the back, and uh, this is a uh, a fig tree. Uh, he, from everything that I knew, actually uh, loved the area. The, the the he bought a lot on Airport Road and built the house, which uh, then he ends up having a store. He and Evelyn on the uh, on the, on the first floor. And um, then the community grew around him. Uh, behind, uh, a little around the corner and behind the store was, uh, and their house was the a community that had some permanent residence, but also had a lot of the migrant uh, housing that I had referred to earlier. Uh, Mr. Orr, you know, remembers them being. Uh, awful as many were uh, airport road and a few others in uh, in etra and off of uh, 33 weren't as bad but they certainly weren't uh, up to the standards that should have existed which then ended up being uh, improved back in the uh, back in the 60s and uh, and 70s kim <clears throat> So when Aul and I were talking, Aul said that he made his dad a promise. And his promise was that he would figure out a way to honor him and the black families that had lived on Airport Road and um, made the neighborhood a neighborhood. The store was a center of activity. He... Uh, Many of the laborers stopped there to, to buy things before they were going to uh, work. Uh, also, as mentioned before, there was, um, I'm sure there were some times that there were, it was not a working time, that there were some interruptions that uh, Mr. Sumbury had to assist to get straightened out by the uh, migrants that were living you know, uh, behind him and over in in that neighborhood on Evan Drive and a couple other names that I've forgotten back there. So Aul and I talked and um, I had mentioned to him that the timing might work because the railroad tracks, which um, Aul remembered, the railroad tracks specifically that goes from Heightstown to Pemberton, known as the Pemberton Heightstown Railroad, uh, was no longer in existence. The railroad was not. But the plan was to continue that uh, path as a, a trails, rails to trails for hiking, biking, and, and running that eventually will be 12 and a half, 13 miles long all the way from Crosswicks, Crosswicks Creek area to Airport Road. 
So it will terminate at Airport Road as being the furthest northwest point of the uh, of the trail. So now it was like uh, I I I was sort of all in. Uh, Aula, when he gets something on his uh, mind, can be pretty uh, pretty convincing. And um, so I'd mentioned this to him and said, let me do some homework and see what might be the possibility of some locations where we could memorialize the uh, George and Evelyn in the, in the store and the West Airport Road uh, community, as well as uh, all Black families in Heightstown and East Windsor that contributed so much to, uh, to our community. Uh, on the south, the south side of Airport Road, uh, I'll show you some pictures of the potential locations. And obviously one of the things I was looking for was uh, either municipally owned properties or uh, in this case, JCP and L's right away, which is the uh, part of the uh, trails, uh, rails to trails property. Additionally, what I did not put in here is that there's a Pentecostal church, Mount Zion, which um, I understand I'm going to smile because this is what Aula told me, and, and I don't know if I got a chance to talk to, uh, to Nate about it, but his mother went to one church around the corner and his father went to uh, this church, which was almost right next door. And I believe this church is still owned by the uh, by the Pentecostal church, which is up centered in uh, Somerset. Um, so that would be another potential location to have some, some type of uh, roadside memorial to black history in uh, in our in our area. Um, obviously that would probably cost more because it would have to be purchased, but it's, uh, certainly a possibility. All right, Kim. <clears throat> well, the time flies and, uh, this discussion, oh, uh, and I started in 2019. And then of course we all know what happened, uh, shortly after the, uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And uh, that certainly slowed down a, uh, a lot. However, East Windsor Township had been awarded uh, just under $500,000 uh, by the state of New Jersey Department of Transportation to construct the, <coughs> excuse me, the remainder of the Union Transportation Trail. Uh, that, as I mentioned before, uh, would terminate on Airport Road. For those that are still familiar with the area, right now, uh, the terminus is Old York Road, uh, just uh, west of one of the lakes in Assenpink, about a third of the way between uh, Heightstown and uh, Allentown. So it does not cross, uh, but this will have it crossed. And then it will end up going behind uh, the uh, Working Dog uh, Winery and um, also past a, uh, two, if not three, small parks, community parks that are between there and Airport Road. When the DOT gave this grant, they mentioned that what they like to do is uh, give grants that they know the towns will come back and want more in order to finish the project. Uh, so this in some ways was a initial, I'll call good faith type of grant, you know, to do the engineering and anything that was necessary in order to, uh, to get it underway. Uh, again, I mentioned we've had two, two to three years of, uh, of COVID. So a lot of that stuff got slowed up. But as far as I know, there would still be the availability of uh, more grant money for the township to finish the uh, project. Okay, Kim. All right, so here you'll be able to see a little bit better where I'm where I'm speaking about. The red arrow is uh, essentially 
the railroad line. Uh, right at the point of that arrow, the lowest part of that point, you'll be familiar with that is the Speedway bicycle shop. Um, so many probably didn't even know, except for you know the Sunbury family and me and a few others, that there was actually a railroad track there. And that railroad track crossed 33 and uh, went to a, uh, the main line of the Camden and Amboy Railroad. And there was a turntable there. Uh, and it was uh, very, very important to the area. It's worthwhile mentioning that it tying the, the railroad history with the, uh, the Black American family history uh, is really important, including agriculture, because much of the uh, labor for the building of the uh, railroads, as well as obviously agriculture, came from the, uh, from the Black families. This railroad line, Pemberton to Heightstown railroad line, uh, for many, many years, decades, carried almost all of the farm goods from uh, that farm belt that I mentioned, you know, down to um, uh, crossing 539 Cream Ridge area and, uh, and further south of New e Egypt and uh, would bring them to this turntable. And many of us remember the old farmers co-op that had the huge uh, the huge silos there. And then obviously across the street was the uh, Agway and the, uh, the Tri-County uh, auction market. Now the blue arrow, arrow in the center points to where the Sunbreeze lived. So we're not talking about a long distance. Uh, it, it's easy walk or biking, you know, to if there can be a park area at the point where the uh, where the terminus is, terminus is of the trail, uh, then uh, that would be great. That's most ideal, in my opinion. Uh, however, that may not meet the uh, with agreement of those that need to give approval. Uh, the blue, again, is where the store was in the house. And um, the white arrow is uh, just to the east. And there's a large area there that was dedicated to the township by the uh, by the developer when the developer uh, had uh, purchased the ground where the speedway used to be. Okay, Kim. There was the church that I mentioned. The second building past the church is the uh, where the Sunbury's uh, store was. Okay, Kim. Uh, even though that's a little bit further away, one of the nice things about it is there's already an entrance road and culverts, et cetera, to get in there because it was there because it was the uh, one of the entrances to the uh, speedway, um, which was also called the fairgrounds, by the way. Uh, some of us remember going to circus or a couple other things there um, many decades ago. Okay, Kim. <clears throat> There's just a little article uh, reflecting what I uh, mentioned as far as the uh, junction of the uh, Pember Pemberton to Heightstown Railroad. Um, it's um, the area where the Sunbury's uh, lived was also referred to before Mr. Sunbury built the house as the woodsheds or also uh, Excelsior uh, because it was a little swampy area across the street and uh, but the woodsheds was uh, to the west, which is where they stored all the wood, cut the wood, and in order to fire the uh, the steam engines for the for the uh, trains. Okay, Kim. <clears throat> uh, this is just a uh, map that shows where the uh, Pemberton Heightstown Railroad went. And it eventually, when it was completed, did a little bit of a uh, crescent, you know, to uh, get back to the main line of the Camden and the Amboy. 
uh, just a little historical reference here. Uh, the rail line, both the Cannon Amboy, but also the, also the uh, um, Pemberton to Heightstown Railroad, uh, also uh, transported a lot of marl. Uh, marl was uh, the main fertilizer uh, back in the 1800s, early 1900s, and uh, it was from very rich soil, which we have in the area. And uh, so, uh, ironically, that was taken out for years. Now the farmers have to fertilize the, those fields where the marl was taken. And of course, Marlton and Marlboro are uh, a reference to the marl mm. in that, those areas. Okay, Kim. Uh, there's again the arrow where the end of the uh, rails to trails path would be at the airport road right by the house, the Sunbury house, which is uh, again just a uh, few hundred feet from the Route 33. Okay, Kim. <clears throat> One of the things that um, I had talked about and which he thought was a good idea is we need to create, it would be great to create a, um, a photo uh, history of the contributions of the black families to agriculture and the railroad and the other commerce that or was in and is in Heightstown and East Windsor. Uh, this is one of those pictures and potatoes were very, very uh, big for this area. And this is a potato harvester. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a lot of these pictures, but I hopefully will be able to find them from the uh, state archives and other folks who may have them and contribute it as well as uh, so many that we could switch them out, you know, so that for a certain period of time, it would uh, be certain things and then they could continually be rotated. Okay, Kim. <clears throat> uh, besides there being uh, potatoes, there was also a lot of uh, apples and, uh, and peaches in the area. And uh, again, when they needed to be harvested, it was uh, not a long period of time where the additional labor was needed. So that's when the migrant labor came up. And you remember from the history of Mr. Mr. Sumbry, that's what attracted him uh, to this area, having come up here and working all up the coast or as the harvest needs changed. You, after it was finished in uh, the Delmarva, you would move up to New Jersey. And uh, he really, really thought that this was a great place where he could raise his family. Okay, Kim. Here's some uh, apples again. Uh, this was uh, probably in the farm outside of uh, Bryanville, uh, which um, now the name escapes me of when the, uh, of the a family who had that. And, uh, but uh, there was a lot of apples around here. Kim. <clears throat> and this is a pretty old time tractor you see that doesn't even have uh, rubber wheels. So it's uh, probably right around the 1920 uh, era. And um, but again, this was uh, harvesting the, uh, uh, the potatoes was uh, quite manual intensive back then. Okay, Kim. Uh, this, I believe, is on the Ely Farm, which is out outside of uh, Etra. Uh, I'm sorry, outside of what we now call Roosevelt. Uh, Ely's owned a lot of uh, a lot of acreage, and there are a lot of uh, potatoes that were uh, that were harvested. Uh, this is what's known as grading, and that is that you'll see that they work together here, and the uh, and the man at the standing to the furthest to the left is grading. He's he's looking at the potatoes, throwing out the undersized or the bad ones, and then they're 
uh, put in the bags. Uh, you may note that on the bags, uh, the, uh, the name of the potatoes is Molly Pitcher uh, Potatoes. So uh, these clearly were from the area. Okay, okay. <clears throat> One of the uh, things about Heightstown that I think Mr. Sunbury probably, uh, probably noticed and um, is historically factual is that back in 1913, 1910, and 1917, which you'll see the pictures, these pictures are from the front steps of um, what had been the successor to the first academy. So there were uh, eight grades that were in this uh, building, four on the ground floor and four on the top floor. More recently, folks will remember it as the YMCA building. Uh, before that, it was the uh, after it was the elementary school, the uh, the Masons bought it and had it as their Masonic temple. A few years ago, the borough of Heightstown bought it to save it and is uh, is converting it to the uh, borough hall. Okay, Kim, and this again was 1913, so you can see the integrated class. Go ahead. Same with here. This is this is an older class, a couple years older than the uh, one we just looked at. Okay, Kim. And uh, this is the earliest picture, uh, but again, probably the ages are in between the ones that I just uh, just showed you. <clears throat> okay, Kim. <clears throat> This is just a picture of the, uh, to the left, you'll see a railroad car. And um, this is where the Pemberton and uh, Heightstown Railroad crossed Route 130. Of course, or, I'm sorry, Route 33. It looks uh, quite different now, uh, but Railroad Avenue uh, would have been just past those railroad cars. Okay, Kim. Uh, when... The, 1920, what we call Mercer Street, uh, was and and Route 33 was being built as Highway 7. There again was a lot of uh, black labor that was involved with uh, building that, and uh, as you can see, the steeple of the Baptist Church is in the uh, in the background. All right, Kent. Um, airport Road, a lot of people say, well, Airport Road, where did Airport Road ever get its name? Well, there was actually an airport on Airport Road. And um, besides some small single family, it's also where airmail first came to uh, the Heightstown East Windsor area. Uh, in this picture just happens to be some people that uh, folks will remember in the center. The tallest man is Red Becker, Jerome Becker, who was mayor. And it was also postmaster one time and was the head of uh, McGraw Hill uh, Postal Operations. Okay. But then what <clears throat> Nate and Aula and Maria and Margaret probably remember the most is not being able to go to sleep on Friday night or Saturday night. And actually, I lived close enough to the East Windsor Speedway that I thought I had to open up my windows on both sides of the house to let the uh, stock cars come in one side and go out the other. It could get quite quite loud, um, particularly when the wind was uh, was out of the south. Uh, but uh, we joke and sort of remind, uh, we, we, we laugh about the memory of the speedway and the uh, and the fairground, fairgrounds. Okay, Kim. <clears throat> another picture of the speedway looking towards the uh looking towards the east okay kim thanks all right so one of the goals and besides having a good idea you sort of have to come up with a plan and um as i had uh, gone over with aula uh wherever it might be we would need uh, a minimum of four spots for uh for vehicles uh, plus, uh, uh, including one handicap spot, that would be the least costly. If we were able to do the 
and that would be roadside if it was able to be off road because of the existence of the land availability that of course would be a little more costly uh, but there is that one lot that i mentioned as a possibility and um, then the, the last uh, would be the as i mentioned i thought the prime location Ula, Ula and i agreed uh, but um, might have difficulty with, uh, with being able to get approval for that. Okay, Ken. <clears throat> now this is uh, three years old and I've done some cost estimates as far as the different types of signs. We've all been to roadside places and seen different historical signs and memorials, et cetera. So there's a plethora of choices as regards to the size the construction material and uh, and 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 such. So I'm going to show you some examples. Okay, Kim. Obviously, this is one of the larger ones. It could serve as a pavilion. Many places for uh, for signs and memorials uh, to uh, uh, to the purpose of the location. Uh, but again, it's um, it could be costly. You know. Uh, depending on the size. Okay, Kim. Similar but smaller is uh, is this the uh, the it doesn't allow for as much information, but if it was done with changing out, it could serve a purpose, or you could have multiple ones of these. Okay, Kim. Um, these are some of the most popular in the last decade that I've seen, but in the number of places that I go, uh, when they're exposed to the weather and they're exposed to the animals and birds and everything else, they tend to uh, not look great unless they're maintained quite, quite often. Okay, Ken. Okay, one more. And again, if they're in direct sunlight, they can fade. And in this one, uh, this is actually inside. It's the same materials as last two, but it's in one of the barns at uh, Wall, which is uh, Walmford, which is uh, by Cream Ridge. And of course, if it's not exposed to sunlight, they may they last uh, much longer. Okay, kids. <clears throat> okay, you can keep going. Uh, besides the importance of the Sunbury family and the East Railroad Avenue, um, I'm sorry, the West uh, Railroad Avenue uh, com community, uh, Airport Avenue, I'm sorry. There are also others that ought to be recognized in, in our opinion, who will agree with me, and that is uh, Patience Track uh, was uh, a, a runaway slave and uh, she, her freedom was actually uh, purchased by Aaron Ely. Uh, his farm was out in East Windsor, where this, where East Windsor Cemetery is, where this is a tower. And uh, he bought her. Uh, she was being chased, and there was a bounty hunter, and Aaron paid the bounty hunter and and bought her and gave and gave her her free, freedom. Uh, she asked to stay with the family, which she did until she was 92, and she's buried in the Ely family uh, plot in East Windsor Cemetery. Okay, Kim. This was just a little recognition, you can keep going, Kim, of that the Ely farm I just mentioned is uh, at the, at the uh, uh, divide of the uh, watershed between the, the Raritan and the and the Delaware, and on one side of the East Windsor Cemetery, the water flows to the Delaware. The other, this side, the north side, uh, flows to the Raritan into the Atlantic Ocean. Well, what we're going to need to be able to uh, to complete this is additional pictures, more stories, better cost estimates, and final approval from the township, and of course, always funding. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> On the committee um, was Ola. Uh, Dave Corbone, who was a friend of uh, Ola's from their uh, from their uh, work in uh, 
prison uh, missionary work. Skip Berman, who's a township resident. Curtis Crowell, who I mentioned, who did the great article back in 1997. Uh, Pat Donahue, uh, that actually lives out off of uh, Disrail Hill uh, Road. Uh, but as with everything, we're always in need of volunteers. Okay, Ken. All this would not be possible, you know, without um, uh, Ula's ability to uh, uh, convince me <laughs> that this was a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, he's not going to be here to uh, to see it, uh, but um, I think maybe he will see it. And uh, but it's certainly something that I want to accomplish for him and for the Sunbury family. Okay, Kim. Were there any questions that came up? Okay. I think you can hear me, right? I, I can hear you, yes. Great. Okay. Uh, that was a beautiful photograph of him. There yeah, are right. a couple of questions that came up, but I had a couple questions as well. And everyone, feel free to use the chat feature to ask any questions you may have, and comments are always welcome. Um, we're talking, Cappy, primarily about the mid-20th century. Is that correct? Uh, yes. He, he um, actually bought the lot right after World War II, and uh, his, I think, I'll say 46, 47. Uh, Nate, I think, was born in uh, 51, and uh, Ula, I, I think, was 49. So they lived here a, 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 a year or two before they started their family, and um, but stayed there their entire their entire lives. And but yes, his uh, the store and all the work that he did at Braun at Braun Nursery and uh, greenhouses and the uh, all the work around town. Uh, was during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and I forget when he passed, uh, Mr. Summary. Yes. Um, from what you know, what was life like for the Summaries and other local families and migrant workers in this area at that time? In my opinion, um, there was a lot of bad places to live if you were a uh, Black American, particularly if you were a a migrant worker who was coming up here and trying to uh, relocate and uh, raise a family. I, I believe that uh, Mr. Sumbri found this to be a uh, welcoming place. As I mentioned, the schools were not segregated. Even back then, a lot of the schools in the early 20th century were still segregated even through 1940s after World War, right around World War II. Uh, but again, Heightstown never did have segregated uh, schools, you know, from the shortly after the time that the academy was started back in the uh, 18, 1870s. As a matter of fact, one superintendent that they hired came in and uh, said that he wanted to segregate the school. So I, they either fired him the first day or uh, told him never, <laughs> never to show up for work again. Uh, so I think that was true with most of the uh, migrants that decided to stay here. Uh, there were also many multi-generational uh, families that were already here before the Sumbries got here. Uh, names that you know, a lot of us that have been brought up, uh, worked here, uh, labored here, and uh, raised their families here. The you know, Gunnells, McKnights, Muses, Parrishes, Phillips, Owens, uh, Randolphs. Screws, who I think came up with uh, uh, with the Sumbries, and uh, so I th I think it was looked at. But I'm not black, so I can't uh, speak for them. But everything I'd ever been told seemed that they felt that it was a welcoming community back then. Okay, and approximately how many um, African American families did live in the Airport Road area? Uh, Nate would probably be able to uh, throw a number on chat, but my guess would be about 24 families. Um, I may be a little under or a little over. I'm not sure. 
Okay. And, you know, I just love seeing the photographs that you share in the PowerPoint. I was wondering, um, how well documented is the African American history in the area, Heightstown, East Windsor, Robbinsville? Not, not as well as it should be, and not very well at all. As a matter of fact, two of those photos I actually got from the uh, State Archives Dep Department of Agriculture. They weren't from local families. Um, I'll also be honest with you that I haven't had time to dig into the Historical Society's ar archives um, because uh, a number of reasons and a number of other things. But during this project, we've also been expanding the holdings in the archives and trying to make them so that they're easier to uh, to find items that are uh, that are there. Okay. Um, someone was asking about any source books on the African American community here. Any written uh, information, histor historical information? Well, actually, just, let's see. One of the I'll call it a fun book. Um, I happened to be given by uh, by some uh, old friends, and they this book was um, actually a party th that the uh, families of the uh, both the Railroad Avenue, Airport Road, and the, and, and the, uh, I think they did it every year or every other year that uh, lists almost all of the uh, black families that from the 50s, primarily the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, including all their nicknames. Uh, another mm. another uh, book, or not book, but some letters are from uh, Russ Ballou as far as what he remembers as regards to being brought up in, uh, uh, in, in right off of Railroad Avenue downtown. But unfortunately, there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, a lot of oral it. histories. Correct. Yeah, not enough. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, really unfortunate. Yeah. All the more important to be doing what you're talking about tonight. Um, someone's asking, what can the community do to help move this forward? Um, uh, I, <coughs> excuse me. In terms of the memorial plaques and what have you that you're talking yeah, about, it, it, there's um the the I have not followed up with the township since um, last fall. Uh, there's been again some other issues that that's um, have to be dealt with with the. Um, uh, with the municipal governments all around the state of New Jersey <coughs> and here. So um, I will be following up uh, shortly, you know, to see if they, I, I've held off following up honestly, because I, I haven't wanted to be a, a pest, even though it doesn't seem like I'd be after a number of months, but I have not seen uh, the engineering work, you know, that's on the Pemberton, and uh and heightstown rail line you know that would indicate to me that it was m maybe not to the point where they could make a decision on that yet okay um i'm reading a question here what considerations are being made to offer tours of this site with a focus on migrant families. We didn't speak a lot about migrant families yet tonight. More specifically, black migrant families to nearby schools. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned in my intro that I do walking tours of, uh, of, of downtown and, uh, and also bus tour, you know, for Folks at Meadow Lakes and other senior communities of the uh, of the area. Uh, frankly, I'm not uh, I'm not gifted enough to be able to give a decent tour uh, that will give all the information that should be given to those participating in the tour. 
about the residents of, uh, of Airport Road and of uh, downtown Heightstown and the, and the migrants. Hopefully there are folks around that are able to do that, in which case, if any of them are listening, or if who is listening has a, an old guy like me in the family that you think that you could uh, talk into doing such a thing, I'd be more than happy to meet with them and uh, work with them to come up with a, uh, a strategy of uh, how to maybe put, put together a similar type of uh, walking tours that we do downtown. Okay. Hmm. I've got a couple things just came in. Are you familiar with a similar Hopewell Valley initiative, which involves posting numerous historical placards along the Lawrenceville Hopewell Trail, who may have helpful lessons learned for you, as well as other project guidance? Uh, no, I'm familiar with a lot of the activities uh, around the area, including uh, in the Sarah Lands. There's uh, there's a uh, a cemetery there that was a black cemetery that uh, actually has a couple Revolutionary War uh, veterans that uh, are in there. Uh, but as regards to what's being done along that rail line, uh, no, I'm not familiar with it. I'm familiar with the rail line, but I'm not familiar with what they may be doing over there. Uh, yes. Kathy, this, this is Laura. I actually work with that group. <laughs> um, oh, so if you, if you need contact information uh, so you can get an idea of costs and things and who they've used, I can definitely put you in touch with them. Oh, that'd be great. Absolutely. Okay. I appreciate it. And uh, Kim, while I'm speaking, um, Nathaniel wanted to say something. So um, after you're finished with the next comment, I'm just going to let him um, uh, jump in and, and, and say a few words, okay? Okay, yeah. great. I would love to go up and, and see what, what we're just talking about with Hopewell Valley Initiative. Let me see if there's any more um, comments before we let Nathaniel speak. I just don't want to miss anybody. Give me just a moment. Bear with me. Um, someone said that you can post the information we've been discussing on East Windsor Heights Town Facebook groups, Citizens for East Windsor, and other local Facebook groups. That was okay. a comment. All right. Good. And. I think we're ready for Nathaniel if you'd like to make any comments. Nathaniel's part of the Summary family. You can go ahead, Nathaniel. You might have to um, turn on your mic. Is that it, Ross? Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Oh. Okay. Yes. First of all, how you doing, Cappy? Okay, Nate. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. We go back. We go back a while. Uh, sure on behalf do. of my brother Aola Sumbri and all of the families, the early settlers and founders on Airport Road, the Sumbri family, the Houston family, the Screws family, uh, the West family, so many. I would definitely want to thank you, Cappy, for your efforts to commemorate. Uh, the hard work that many of these Southerners uh, put into their effort to make Airport Road a thriving community. It was a thriving community. Uh, I sent a message. Uh, my, my father had originally purchased this land. My sister Marie and I, we were talking. He bought it from the Romas, the old, what we used to refer as the gypsies, who lived right. at the corner of Airport Road in 33. And my father, uh, he originally came from Phoenix City, Alabama, along with Mr. Screws. And there was a thriving economic community there. Uh, my father's store, uh, he also owned land and he rented um, housing to many of the migrants. We have a, a strange connection because on my mother's side, our aunt Willie C. Johnson, she was what was called a contractor. She would hire migrants to come from the South and they would work the farms and she would work out a range. She was a great businesswoman. She also was the maid at the TV motel there in Hikestown. And we used to go there and work with her, but she was a great leader and she was one of the people that made it a community. Uh, Mr. Joe West, he was an entrepreneur. Um, he also owned the juke joint. 
And there okay. was a, a such a such a thriving community there. Now, a good part of it was uh, the underground economy. And some of you might or might not know what I mean by the underground economy. But there were many things that were illegal in the 1940s and 50s. But on okay. Airport Road, on a Friday and a Saturday night, you could buy it or, <laughs> rent it or whatever you wanted to do. But it made it a, a very diverse community. Um, we had a unique, a unique situation with my father because he was a Southerner with Southern values. We had to go to church. We had to behave well in school. I remember my uh, kindergarten principal, Mr. Hepburn, when he ran for office, he came to my father's store with his political material and my father would talk to people about how Mr. Hepburn was a good man probably because he didn't throw me and Aula out of school when we were <laughs> in elementary school. But he was a good man. You you know you know the Hepburns, uh, Cappy? You yes. know the Hepburn girls? Yeah. yeah and, Mr. and we were very much, my father worked for Brown Brothers there at the Flores. Uh, I played Little League Baseball. Cappy, you and I probably played for Cappy, uh, Cap, Cap, uh, 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 Stoltz, and who was the L team, Cappy? Alan and Stoltz. Alan and Stoltz, oh, Cappy, how did I mess that up? Um, but, but, but there were, uh, we were an integral part of the community, the people on Airport Road. Airport Road, for many people, did not have the best reputation, but there were very solid middle class values there, people who believed in education. If we did not do well educationally, my parents punished us, you know, much like parents who are, you know, they talk about the uh, the tiger moms uh, or in, in the Asian culture. But uh, my mom and my father, they believed in education. They didn't have a lot of formal education, but we had to read the Bible. My brother Aula was a, a Pentecost, uh, a, um, uh, a seven-day Adventist minister. My sister Margaret, uh, Pastor uh, Margaret Sumbry Drawing was a minister. My sister Marie, uh, she is a, a Jehovah's Witness um, pioneer. pioneer. <laughs> now, they all ask what happened to me. Well, they had to convert someone. <laughs> and, and I was the one that they probably spent most of the time. But, but my family uh, and, and many of the families on Airport Road were uh, so much a part of the community and the economy because yeah. it was a thriving economy there. And I wanted to make sure, Captain, I really appreciate everything you're doing. And I know how hard you and I will work together to, 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 to get this situation, this commemoration to this point. And, um, and I'm really appreciative. I'm really appreciative of everything you've done. And you know, you and I, we go back, because your dad was one of the people who taught me how to play ping pong. <laughs> or when we were doing some uh, political organizing when we were in high school together. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. But, um, yeah, I, uh, and I, I, Marie, I, she appreciates it too. <laughs> yeah, I'll I tell you, uh, I'll just add this so we Thank can. you. Hey, Marie. <laughs> so uh, back in uh, high school, there used to be political parties. So you didn't run by yourself. You ran with four other people. And uh, I, I talked Nate into running with me. Uh, but the party didn't get elected. The individual got elected, even though you ran uh, as a party. Nate won, I lost. I've never forgiven you for that, Nate. Uh, but that's just how it happened. So, yeah. Yeah. But that was a long time ago, my friend. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. We, yeah. we have some great memories, great memories. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, I, just, well, I just wanted to make that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you. And um, I think... Uh, Probably I'm, I've gone over here a little bit, so the library is probably ready to pull the plug. Uh, okay. But Nate, yeah. thanks, thanks for thanks for coming on your comments. It was very nice. Oh, so. And thank you again, Cappy. And, and I thank the High Sound Historical Society. Thanks. Thank you, Nathaniel. You're adding great color to this talk. Much appreciated. Love yes. hearing about your family. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, oh, okay. Some... Uh, have we gone over our allotted time? 
We're okay. No, I, I wanted to add one more comment that somebody wrote out, and that's that they wanted to encourage us to check out the Stroudsburg Sauerland African American Museum and Montgomery Township. Yeah, it's that's good information one I... about the African Americans in the so, uh, Sauerland Mountain region north of us, no, um, northwest yeah. of us. Yeah, that's the one I referred to that's been restored recently that has a couple African American uh, uh, Revolutionary War veterans. And there's a Stoutsburg uh, AME church, you know, about a mile, mile and a half away. And it's right off of Province Line Road. We have a couple more minutes, Nathaniel, if you wanted to add any more comments before we go. Well, um, I just wanted to, to, to share that um, during the, the period of uh, the 1940s, 1950s, when the migrations occurred, um, and Airport Road was a, a quite a bit different from a, some of the other areas like Etra Road, Milford Road, because they also had migrants who lived there but they did not have the economic uh, base that Airport Road had. There weren't churches there. There weren't businesses there. Um, one of our classmates, uh, Cappy, uh, Joe Moore, his father uh, was a, a very great mechanic, and he, uh, he ran a, uh, a salvage business where people would come and get parts from cars and and Mr. Houston, he also ran a salvage uh, business there. And there was a, a just, I just wanted people to realize there was a thriving economic center there. Most of it was above board, like my dad's store. You know, he was, and he was a wonderful man. Um, he would have things, he would put what he called people on the books. Though That was people who couldn't quite afford to pay for items in the store. Uh, he would just keep a, a tally. Uh, Marie did a lot of work with him in the store. I guess she was the only one he trusted, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but he would, uh, but but what happened to Airport Road, uh, Kathy, you know this, um, once the Acme Food Town Center um, developed, I think it was on Stockton Street, right. a lot of the customers that my dad had at Sunbury's Grocery Store, all of a sudden they vanished. Yeah. And you know they, they probably went for the better price, but um, but when he uh, had the store at his peak in the 50s and 60s, my mother did not have to work. She pretty much was a housewife, and uh, the house he built, he and some carpenters. It was a nice two-story house, and uh, there were people uh, in our communities, uh, Cap, as you know, who two-story houses weren't that common. Uh, Hikestown is a you know, working-class community. And many of the homes were the veterans had gotten uh, after the Second World War. And, um, and many people who lived in homes um, in the downtown part of Hikestown, um, like Academy Street, Wood Street, many of those homes were pretty dilapidated too. And many of them were as bad as the homes in Airport Road. In fact, I think once the um, projects were built, many of the homes that were demolished uh, did not have running water or inside right. bathrooms. You know, yeah. I I have friends who who live there, but uh, Airport Road somehow got stigmatized as this place, <laughs> this undesirable. But um, it was also a place that was not policed well. Uh, when uh, when something happened in Airport Road, the state police came. Uh, the hikes down. There was no East Windsor police at that time. I don't recall. No, and anytime right. there was an, an incident. The state police would show up and all the foolishness and chaos would cease because those guys were usually over six feet tall. And they, when you would see them put those white gloves on, you knew someone was getting ready to get knocked out. <laughs> yeah, Nate, let me interrupt this. It may be worthwhile mentioning because uh, you told me this, or both you and Ola told me this, but maybe Ola first, is that the first uh, black uh, state trooper in yes. New Jersey, uh, was stationed in Heightstown. That is correct. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, he's now a, an attorney in uh, yeah. in Trenton. He, I don't know if he's retired yet, uh, but he uh, he was stationed in Heightstown, and the uh, the other troopers, the white troopers, would send him to Paul's Inn, you know, to uh, mm -hmm. to get some of the good food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Paul's Inn was right around, almost in. Uh, 
in Nate and, and, uh, and Marie's backyard. And most people now know it as Club 8. But that was uh, Paul Davis's uh, Paul's Inn. And which also, by the way, was one of only two places in the area, big area, not in Princeton, not in Lawrence, Ewing, et cetera, that was in the, I think it's called the Green Book, which uh, families, black families bought in the in the 50s. And, and uh, when they would go on a, a trip, you know, if they would go to a, a vacation, et cetera, and drive through a town and they needed some place to stay or eat, of course, there are places that would not allow black families in. Uh, so somebody, I forget who it was, published this book and it listed places around the country where you could, uh, that was a friendly place, you know, for, uh, for black families to stop. And Paul's, Paul's Inn was uh, one of the two. The other one, I forget its name, uh, but was downtown, you know, behind the, uh, off of Liberty Street, uh, which... <laughs> You and I may be the only ones who remember where Liberty Street was. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yep, yeah. Well, well, you know, Cappy, uh, I, I knew uh, the owner, Paul Davis, and I knew his ch children. Well, Sylvia Davis was one of our classmates. Correct. The class yep. of 1969. I don't mind saying 1969. I'll be happy. <laughs> but she was one of our classmates. And um, uh, he, along with my father, were probably the two largest black land owners in the Hikestown, East Windsor area. Yeah. Um, my father's land went deep into the woods. Yep. And um, uh, in, in fact, uh, in his land uh, adjourned our land. And um, and I would, because uh, he had also a baseball team that he sponsored. I remember yep. Larry Gunnell and Shink and some of the great athletes of the past, they played on his baseball team. And it was, uh, and they would play right across the tracks from Paul's Inn. And I remember it being a great time, Yeah, you know, because yeah. teams would come from all around. Yeah. 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 But good Nathan days. Uh, Nathaniel and Cappy, if I could in interrupt, this is Kim from the library. Uh, can I, I'd like to ask one more question before we go. Okay. I was wondering what's visibly left today in this community. Is the summary store building is that still um standing? Yeah, yeah, the house is still there. There's new houses that are built on either side. The uh, summary house has been refurbished, modified uh, yeah. quite a bit uh, with a I think an addition on the back. I'm not sure though. And um, I haven't noticed whether there's a greenhouse in the back. But the church, the Mount Zion church is there. Um, you know, one of the, the, there's only one problem I have with Nate as an adult, or Nathaniel, and, they, and that is that he's a better gardener than me and uh, hasn't <laughs> sent me any seeds or anything to uh, to make me better at it. So, so he, he, got the, he got the talent from his dad and he spends a lot of time in a gardening. Okay, but, but Kathy, you know, I often, when I'm working in my, my garden, I think about my dad. Yes. And as you know, I was a basketball player in high school, and I like politics. And my dad would probably be looking up from heaven saying, what is that guy doing down there working in that garden? I couldn't get him to turn the, uh, the, the, the soil over. <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, he, would, he, would, he would have a whole night to go out there and turn, and then he would just give up on us and say, all right, I, I'll do it, you know. But um, I, I just thank God for all of his knowledge and wisdom that I guess I got through genetic inheritance because it definitely wasn't through any other means. Oh, thank you so much, Nathaniel, for all that information about your family yeah. and the community. Much appreciated. Yes. Yeah, thank thanks you. so much. Thank and thanks, you Cappy, do. too. Okay. Yes. Okay, my friend. You take it Good easy. Seeing you. Good seeing you all. Okay. All right. All right. Great to see you. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for, for attending Cappy's talk. Cappy, thanks for sharing your research and your time with us tonight. And if anybody who's participating has any follow up questions, please email the library and we can pass them on to Cappy. And you'll receive a follow up email with additional resources and answers to your questions. And have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks so much for participating. And okay. take care.